Hello everyone! Um, I've been at Figma for a couple of years now, um, but due to the pandemic, this is my first in-person event, so I just want to say that I'm super excited to be here with all of you today. Um, my name is Naomi. I'm a software engineer on Figma's design systems team. Essentially, we're the team that builds features for design systems in, inside of Figma. Um, so this means we're developing features that allow users to create design systems, maintain, and use these systems. Hi, I'm Sue. I am also an engineer on the design systems team at Figma. And today, we're going to give you all a behind the scenes into component properties. But before we dive into props, let's first take a step back and talk about how components came to be. So if you're a longtime Figma user, you might remember that we first launched components all the way back in 2016. And this was a really huge launch for us because it really built the foundation of allowing larger design teams to scale their design systems. A couple years later in 2020, we launched Variants. And this was also really exciting for us because it really just multiplied the power of components, letting people create a component set with multiple related components. And so we've come a long way since 2016, but of course, there's still a lot we can do to make using Figma easier. So one of the issues that with variants is that designers still have to draw out every single permutation of what they want a component to look like, which is really time consuming. And we're increasingly seeing developers start to use Figma, but developers still have to go into the complicated design file and manually abstract the variant into code. And finally, people love the idea of variants so much that they really just ran with the idea of it and started creating component sets with hundreds of thousands of variants, an issue that we like to refer to internally as variant explosion. And fun fact, the largest number of variants in a component set is actually 16,000, which is, yes, a huge number of variants to maintain. So to get around this complexity, some design systems authors have started using what's known as base components in their design systems. And here's just a simple example of a base component. But you can imagine that, so here we only have one nested layer. If we have a more complicated component, we might have multiple nested layers. And then it becomes really difficult for a consumer to kind of select the instance layer that they need to know to change what the component looks like. And so even though base components can help design systems authors, they actually introduce a lot more complexity for design systems consumers. And it's not just for Figma users that variant explosion caused a lot of issues for. It also caused a lot of issues for engineers as well. So you might have noticed that when you have a variant selected in Figma, we let you easily toggle between the different variations without any latency or additional network requests. And the way we're able to do this is because for each unique variant instance you have in a file, we pull in the component set as well. So here's just a simple example. If you have a really innocent looking button and you add it to your file, we actually add the entire component set into the file as well. And under normal circumstances, this isn't too bad. But you can imagine that in the 16K variant example, pulling just one instance of one of those buttons will pull in the entire 16,000 variants as well, which can cause this really dreaded red banner that shows you that you're out of memory and you can't do anything else in Figma. So after all of these issues, we kind of went back to the drawing table after the variants launch and asked ourselves, is there anything else we can do to make building design systems in Figma a lot easier? And so that's when we started brainstorming what's now known as props. So how did we go about um, building component properties? We actually started the initial thinking for this feature almost two years ago, which was shortly after the launch of variants, um, as Sue alluded to. So in December 2020 is when we started early brainstorming for this feature. Here you can see some pictures from our first brainstorming session where our cross-functional team got together to sort of brainstorm ideas for different solutions for some of these issues, like variant explosion. In February 2021, our designer Shayna created some initial designs for this feature and brought them to DesignCrit, where she was able to get feedback from various designers at Figma. In April 2021, we also continued to get more feedback on the direction of our designs by taking some of them to user testing. Um, and here we can see that uh, internally, we also have a lot of noodles in our prototyping um, 
designs. And as you can see here, it gets a little bit crazy. And we actually have an internal Slack channel where we collect some of these pasta pictures. But this was really helpful because we were able to validate a lot of our decisions around what kinds of flows we wanted to create for this feature. In June, we started engineering planning. Now, for engineering planning, we wanted to be really deliberate about making smart choices so that we can handle a bunch of different edge cases that come up when we're dealing with components and instances. There are actually a lot of edge cases, which we'll dive into a little bit later in this presentation, but we wanted to make sure that the engineering data models were really robust. And so therefore, we spent a lot of time planning out how we wanted to build this feature. In addition, we also wanted to make sure that the data model was extensible should we want to build on top of the feature in the future. Finally, in August of last year, we started the Eng impl implementation, which involved writing a lot of code, writing a lot of tests, and doing several bug bashes as we started to get more and more feature complete. And then finally, in May of this year, we were able to launch the feature at config. Now, you might be wondering, why did it take over a year for us just to build this one feature? And that's because we had to balance a lot of different product decisions and product trade-offs with en engineering costs. And we also wanted to consider the direction in which design and collaboration are trending. So as design systems mature and designers work more closely with developers, we're actually seeing Figma components start to become more complex, mirroring the complexity of code components. So could this new feature that we were building help align design components more simply with code components? On the design systems team at Figma, we also like to think of our users as belonging to one of two groups, either design systems authors or design systems consumers. Many of you in the audience today probably identify as design systems authors. And we consider design systems authors to be our power users who spend a lot of their day creating, maintaining, and organizing large design systems. The design systems they create need to be simple enough for themselves to maintain, but also comprehensive enough for a consumer to be able to adapt to a wide variety of scenarios, and also self-documented so anyone can just come in and understand how to use a component. On the other hand, we have DS consumers. And consumers can really be anywhere from complete beginners to power users as well. Consumers probably need to spend their time searching through large, large design systems and also be able to adapt a component to a real life scenario that they're working with. And so these two different user groups have radically different priorities and use Figma in very different ways. And so with all of these different priorities, we had to work really closely with cross-functional partners to iterate on the product behavior and balance different product and engineering trade-offs. So one example of a product trade-off we had to make was in the first iteration of component props, when we first started thinking about it, we actually wanted to attach props to layer names. So you can click on this prop icon, and it would open up a picker with a list of all the names inside your component. And then you can click on one of those names and then attach a prop to the name. Now, this model quickly introduced a couple of issues for us. For example, what happens if two layers have the same name? Or what happens if I rename one of the layers so now it matches another layer? And these are all issues that come up because of declarative design principles, where the user describes the desired output given the current state, but doesn't tell us the exact control flow. This also makes it hard for engineering because we can't keep the data model in sync since we can't infer user intent from action. And so after a lot of brainstorming, we came up with a more imperative product design where users can explicitly tell us how a prop should control a layer. In this new design, instead of attaching a prop to a layer name, we'll attach a prop to specific fields on layers instead, which have stable IDs under the hood. And this new design is a lot easier for us because you will create a prop first and then select the layers and then attach the prop to those layers. And note that this does introduce an extra step for design systems authors, but we were OK with front loading this complexity here since DS authors are power users and authoring only happens once, but consumption can happen a lot more times. And this authoring complexity also kind of inspired us to build a bunch of other features that we lumped into the component props launch, such as select all matching layers. And select all matching layers lets you basically select a layer inside a component set, 
and then we'll match all the other layers with the same name and layer hierarchy, and then you can easily apply a prop now that you have everything selected. So in addition to some of these product challenges, we also had to dive into several engineering edge cases. Um, and a lot of these stem from the complexity that uh, comes with components and instances. So to sort of explain that complexity, I'm going to take a deep dive into how some of Figma is implemented. So you can imagine that as a user, you'll navigate to a Figma file either in the browser or in our desktop app. When you do so, you're going to download a .fig file from the cloud. A .fig file is our custom file format, which is able to store your file content um, in that file. And then what we do is once we sort of download this fig file, we will parse the data and then render the contents so that your file looks like your design that you've been working on. So what does this look like for most, in, most layers, um, layers that are not instances? Let's go ahead and take an example with just frames. So let's say we create a very basic button with some frames, um, text layers, vector layers, et cetera. What would the .fig file look like? Well, here is a visual representation of what the .fig file is going to look like. Each of the layers in our design maps exactly to one object in the file. And each of these objects contains some information. So for example, the text button is going to contain the following information, its type, its name, the content, color, font size, et cetera. And all of this is stored in that file. So how does this differ for instances, and what makes instances so complicated? Well, if we take an example um, similar to the one before, where we have an instance of a button as opposed to a button frame, we would imagine that the fig file is going to look something like this, because we have the exact same layer hierarchy. It's just different, because now we have an instance. Um, however, the reality is that it actually looks more like this where we actually don't store any of the children object layers um, in the .fig file. And that's because we can actually infer all of the information about the instance from the component it inherits from. And so this is a huge sort of memory optimization that we can do so that we don't have to store so much information in the file. And so when we're looking at the instance layer, what we're actually going to store in terms of the object is just its type and the component that backs it. So in this case, this component is inheriting from the button component. Or sorry, this instance is inheriting from this button component. So you might ask, you know, what happens when we add an override? When we add an override, we have some, some data that's unique to that particular instance. So here, we might override the text button layer, and now it'll say favorite. And so where we store that information is going to be part of the instance object. And so we have some additional metadata that provides the override info. To implement component props, we added yet another piece of metadata to the instance object where we store the props. And what you'll notice is here, we have both overrides and props. And sometimes they have to intermingle and work together. To make things even more complicated, you can imagine a very you know, complicated layer structure like this, where we have a nested instance. And the reality is that we actually just store the top level instance for this entire nested instance hierarchy. And so there's a lot of complications and edge cases that occur when we have to figure out, you know, how do we render the contents of this instance? And how do we actually show what the, the children's properties are when we're you know, rendering your file? And so these are some of the edge cases that we have to consider when building um, features for components and instances. So how does this relate to some of the things that we were dealing with when building props? Well, one of the questions that we asked ourselves was, what does it mean to assign a value to a property? So for those of you who've used this feature, you'll notice that when we, whenever you create a property, you'll have to assign a value to it. And one possible meaning for that value is an initial value. So an initial value means that when you create the instance or you create a new property, we're going to explicitly assign the value. So you could take an example with this button component where we've explicitly assigned content equals button. When we create an instance, the instance is going to in, um, explicitly assign the content property on it. So what that means is when the component is changed, the instance retains its value. So for example, we could maybe change the main component to say click now. And so now its property has actually changed. But because we've already stored information on the instance, we're not going to change the instance at all. So the instance will retain that value. 
Another option for what a value could mean is a default value. So a default value is a fallback that gets inherited when no value is provided. So if we take the same example from before with the button component and a button instance, we can see here that we actually allow uh, the instance to not have any properties. And if this happens, what we'll do is we will inherit the property from the main component. Um, so now we can uh, infer that the instance has content equals button. And so what this means is that instances inherit new changes if they have not been modified. So if we change the main component again, now, because of the inheritance structure, when they're modified, this button will also be modified. But note, this is only going to happen if the instance property has not been modified at all. So if we have changed the value to say something else, we're actually going to be storing that data explicitly, and we'll store it as content equals favorite. And so when the main component updates, the instance will retain its value. And so these were two possible choices for what a value could represent when we're assigning values and creating properties on components. And we you know, really asked ourselves, which option should we pursue? And there were product and design trade-offs for both options. With the initial value approach, that would work, well, work, work really well with Boolean properties, because if you have a Boolean property that's set to true or false, it would be a little bit weird if your values sort of went back to the original value when the main component changes. But with default values, that works a little bit better for text and instance swap properties, especially because that matches the behavior for how overrides work and how overrides are retained on update. And so to answer this question, we actually ended up diving into a specific engineering edge case um, to figure out you know, how uh, these trade-offs would work in different cases that users might um, fall into. So this edge case happens to be around what happens when you update your instances between when we had no props to when we now have introduced the props feature. So there's going to be a conversion process where people are going to be updating their instances to now be using the new design system um, that has component properties. And so what's going to happen is we might create a component with no props. We'll go ahead and create an instance of it. And the instance hierarchy might look something like this, as we've seen before. And then we want to override the text button. And so now we, we don't have props yet, so we're just going to use regular overrides to change the button's content to say favorite. And it'll look something like this, and we'll be able to render it accordingly. Now we've introduced the props feature, and we're going to be adding a text property to the component. So we're assigning the content property to the value button. But now what's going to happen to the instance and its pre-existing overrides? Well, in an initial value world, we have this setup. We have the button um, has an override where the text says favorite, and before the update, we'll have this uh, favorite override. On instance or prop creation, we're going to explicitly assign the value. So we'll create the instance, and we'll actually assign that value using the value that we had given when, during the prop creation process. And that value will be button. So because props take precedence over, over overrides, we may lose previous overrides. And so what's going to happen is you might sort of see this change when you update your instance from the text saying favorite to the text saying button, which is a little unideal. So instead, we also looked at what would happen if we chose a default value approach. Well, similarly, before the update, we'll have the button say favorite. And because the value is a fallback when the value is provided, when we update, we'll actually have like this empty map of properties. And the flexibility of the inheritance model allows us to choose when and where we inherit from. So we can choose to inherit from the overrides as opposed to always um, inheriting from assignments, and, or from property assignments, which is what they call them internally. Um, and this allows us to easily retain overrides on instances when authors add properties. And so when you're converting from instances without props to instances with props, we're able to sort of retain that text property. Um, so this was just one of the edge cases that we had to walk through. And we really wanted to pay close attention to the details so that our users could have a seamless sort of design systems um, upgrade experience. So after optimizing for all of these different issues and edge cases, we finally launched Component Props version 1 at Config last year. Or, sorry, Config this past May. 
Um, but even after the launch, there was still a lot we could do, and we got a lot of both external and internal feedback that the consumption experience might still be less than ideal for DS consumers. So one of the largest pain points that we hear from people even before we started working on component props was that it's really difficult for people to navigate these nested layer hierarchies. And so even though props help because they indicate which layers can be changed and should be changed, um, that doesn't really help a DS consumer if they don't know which instance to click on in the first place. So then over the summer, after the config launch, uh, we kind of went back to the drawing board and started thinking about if there's any easy wins or fast follows that we could work on to make the lives of DS consumers a lot easier. And so with that, we launched three new features as part of Component Properties version 2. The first one is exposed instances. So exposed instances allows you to have a top level instance selected and it'll automatically show props from not only that instance, but also any child instances as well. So you don't have to navigate into the layers panel and click around and guess which instances have those props anymore. The second feature we launched is simplified instances. So simplified instances just simplifies the layers panel, canvas hit targets, and also properties panel. So only layers with props are shown by default. And finally, we have preferred values. Preferred values lets design systems authors specify a set of instances that an instance prop can be swapped to. And then on the consumption side, this makes it a lot easier for DS consumers because all of the preferred values live in a single dropdown folder. So you no longer have to navigate through complicated folder structures in a super small instance picker. And finally, all of these features finally launched in an open beta a couple short weeks ago. So we'd love for everyone to try it out if you haven't already, and feel free to send any feedback our way. And finally, we want to give a big shout out to everyone on the Component Props team that worked super hard on making this feature a reality and also had a ton of fun along the way. So thank you to the team and also to our wonderful audience at Schema today. Thank you for joining us.